gather together here this morning in the presence of God. Would you please stand as we welcome the class of 2018. Please remain standing. Parents, I think more than a few of you will agree with me that it is only appropriate that we begin this service by singing, To God be the glory, great things he has done. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, God. 
so they can be here this Sunday. Um, Lord, I ask that we listen to pastors, Pastor Mike's uh, message so we can grow and serve you. Amen. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. We are glad that you're here with us today. If you are a guest join us, there will be ushers walking down the aisle and you can just wave a hand at them. We are so happy to be able to celebrate Graduate Sunday with our church family. And thank you for all the love, support, and prayers throughout the years. Well, I suppose congratulations are in order. This is, uh, this is a Sunday that I have been anticipating since I got here. We have, you, you may notice, kind of incredible crew of seniors up here this year. Uh, it, has been, it has been just an incredible joy to get to know each of you, um, to, to get to love each of you and serve each of you for just a little bit. Um, and so now, during this time, what we are about to do is we're going to recognize each of these graduates and to give them the opportunity to come up here uh, say a little bit about what their plans are and also an opportunity for them to thank someone or uh, some ones who have been influential in getting them to this place. We know that, uh, that they have not arrived here on their own. It takes, it takes a huge community to bring them to this place and, and there's a lot to celebrate in watching these students graduate this year. And so um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to call uh, each of their names, and they're going to be able to come up here, receive a Bible that we have for them, and then they'll uh, tell you a little bit about their plans, um, and they will also have the opportunity to present a rose to someone um, who has been influential in their lives. And then if you will have a little bit of patience with us, they're going to get to stand up in the front, and we're going to take some pictures uh, of, of these graduates with their um, w with whomever they've given their rose to. All right? So. First, we have uh, Sydney Allen. My plans in the fall are to attend Georgia Southern University where I will be twirling on their majorette line and I would like to present this rose to my parents for always giving me lots of love and support. Madison Brake. I will also be attending Georgia Southern University in the fall. Sydney's my roommate, and I'm going to major in biology, and I would like to present this rose to my parents for always pushing me to do it when I didn't think I could. Grace Dixon. I 
I will be attending Valdosta State University in the fall and I'll be uh, majoring in American Sign Language. I would like to um, give this rose to my mom and my sister for supporting me and uh, for helping me pursue my dreams. Sage Fender. Um, I will also be attending Georgia Southern University to pursue a degree in nursing, and I would like to present this uh, rose to my parents for all their love and support. Andrew Headley. I'll be attending the University of Georgia to study meteorology, and I would like to dedicate this rose to my parents for feeding me and putting up with me through my academic struggles and successes. <laughs> Billy Parker. I'll be attending Mercer University in the fall where I'll play football and major in biology. I want to dedicate this rose to my parents for loving and supporting me throughout this long stretch of time. <laughs> Go Bears. Peyton Parker. In the fall, I will also be attending Mercer University while I will major in biology. And I'd like to present my rose to my mom and my dad for all the love, support, and encouragement they have shown me over the years. David Scott. In the fall, I will be attending Georgia Southern University while I'll pursue a degree in construction engineering. Um, I'd like to pre present this rose to my parents for always being there for me and always loving me. Christina Thomas. Um, I will be attending Georgia Tech with plans to major in neuroscience. Um, I would like to thank this whole church for everything that y'all have done for me, the love and support that you've given me um, over the past 18 years, and I would like to present my rose to my parents for all the love and support that they've given me. And Ford Townsend.
plan on attending Mercer University where I will be playing baseball and uh, getting some type of engineering degree. I dedicate this rose to my dad and my grandmother for showing me how to work hard and to never settle. So some pictures. All right, y'all can y'all can take a seat. The graduates would all right, we have uh, one more recognition to make. Um, every year, as many of you know, we present the Marshall Coyle Leadership Award to one of our graduates in honor of one of our former uh, youth Sunday school teachers at First Baptist um, and, and deacons here who lost his life in a battle with cancer. Um, he was an example to us of what it means to be a faithful follower of Christ, uh, loving this church, loving this youth ministry. And so this award is given out in recognition of a high school senior who exemplifies the character and faith of Marshall. And so this year, it is our pleasure to present the Marshall Coyle Leadership Award to Christina Thomas. This time we're gonna we're gonna worship together. So uh, if the band would, if y'all would come on up, uh, we're gonna we're gonna sing some songs together, worship together, and celebrate the God who has brought us this far. Y'all will stand and join us as we sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but only trust in Jesus name I
Children are dismissed for, for Children's Church. You all can take a seat. Children, if you all just go that, that direction, right out that door. Tell you what, y'all are going to be tired of hearing me by the end of the day, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, let, me just, let me just start off by saying this. Um, you can't go, okay? Just, you just can't. You're not allowed. Um, I mean, after all, what's the point of getting to know you guys and love you guys if you're just going to leave us? What's the deal with that? I don't know. Well, you can't go, okay? So we're just going to call this whole thing off, and um, y'all can go home now. Does that sound good to y'all? Are y'all good with just canceling it? You're just going to keep going, right? No? Okay. All right. All right. Well, then I guess you're going to have to listen to me a little bit more, okay? All right. Um, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, um, yeah, I thought that would be your answer. I thought I would try, though. Okay, so... Um, if that's the case, if you, if you guys are actually really going to leave us and you're really going to go do your own thing, I, 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 feel like, uh, I feel like we have something important to talk about this morning, okay? Um, uh, I want you to listen to me carefully. You've got a Bible now in your hands that you can use. You can follow along with us. Um, but, but if you're about to launch off into the world, um, you need to be ready, uh, you need to be ready for the next phase. You need to be certain of something. You need to be deeply sure of your direction, okay? Now, I'm not talking about like knowing your major and having your career plans figured out and having the 10-year plan like Madison does. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I'm talking about knowing and being deeply certain of your, uh, of your direction, of who you are. And of why you are who you are. Um, this morning, we are going to be walking through the parable of the prodigal son. Okay, now I promise I'm not, I'm not going through the parable of the prodigal son because y'all are leaving home. And the parable of the prodigal son is about a son who grabs all of his dad's money and leaves home and goes and wastes it in a far off place. That's not why I am, I'm not saying that's you. Your parents may disagree with me um, this morning. I don't know, some of them. I'm not saying you're the prodigal son, but, but this morning as we go through the prodigal son, I, I feel like we have something very important that you need to hear because I think this morning the passage is going to set up for you and church for you as well um, something that we need to consider. Uh, it's going to set up a choice for us uh, a choice between uh, three different paths, uh, three ways to live, um, that, that as you leave home and step out into the world, you are going to be faced with this choice. And each day of your life, you are faced with this choice. And so this morning, I have a, a word for you that is not from me, but that is from the Lord, and therefore it actually means something. And so I want you to hear it. Um, I want you to hear what we have uh, to, to listen to and look at this morning in Luke. So if y'all want to, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 15. You'll find there the parable of the prodigal son, beginning in verse 11. Um, and, and so we're going to hear that story. It's really a story that might be better called um, the parable of the two lost sons or maybe the parable of the loving father. There's more going on than just the prodigal here, and I want you to hear that. And so we're going to dive into it. Um, now to set this up, let me give you a little bit of context. 
me tell you what's going on in Luke chapter 15. Um, first, we have to understand that in Luke 15, what we have is a series of parables that Jesus is telling us in response to the criticism of the Pharisees. Now, you guys remember who the Pharisees are, right? They're the, the law-abiding elite of the, the Jewish people who are looking down their noses at Jesus. And at the beginning of chapter 15, if you look there, you see them kind of looking, their, looking down their noses at Jesus and grumbling about him, which they liked to do. Didn't fit their mold. Um, they're grumbling about this so-called rabbi, this miracle worker who, who has been seen regularly doing things that you just didn't do. Eating with sinners, hanging out with unclean folks, spending time with the kind of people that the right people just don't spend time with. They're just the wrong kind of people. So they're grumbling about this, and you see at the beginning of chapter 15, it says um, in verses 1 and 2, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Luke 15, Jesus knows what they're thinking, and he launches into a series of parables that's all about the lost being found. Right, the, the, the joy that comes when a sinner comes home. That's what Luke 15 is all about. And so we've got these parables, these stories, and we get to this, um, we get to this parable of the prodigal son, and he's, what he's doing is he's setting up an opportunity for the Pharisees to respond. He's, he's looking to help them see the world from the perspective of the Father, and it's this idea that's driving this story as we read it. All right, so we're going to just take it a, a few verses at a time. First part of the, of the parable is, is the part we're most familiar with, the part about the prodigal son who ran away. And so we're going to begin in verse 11. I'm just going to read the first two verses to you. Jesus also said, A man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. And so the father does the unthinkable. He distributes the assets to them. He says, okay. Smart people who study this passage, and maybe many of you smart people here have heard this, um, point out that the son is basically saying to his father, Dad, I kind of wish you'd go ahead and die so I could have the money that's coming to me. That's what he's doing. The young man was being driven by a deep impulse to satisfy the cravings of his stomach. Man, he just, he wanted to go out and live it up. That's what he wanted. He knew that if he could get that money, he could go out and satisfy the cravings of his stomach. And so he's pursuing uh, something that we prize pretty highly here. Um, he's pursuing freedom, right? Independence. He's pursuing this kind of uh, independence that will allow him to live the good life that he has envisioned for himself. And so now we know, um, if you're familiar with the story, we know the results of this drive in the younger son, right? We know what happens to him. We're familiar with it. But we're so familiar with it that I think sometimes we fail to hear the echoes of our own situation in it. This picture, th this idea of a young man stepping out into the world armed with energy and, and passion, facing the world on his own and getting what he wants out of it. It's eerily similar, at least in my mind, to the image our world pushes on us as the good life, isn't it? The you-deserve-it life. The follow your dreams, 
no matter where they take you. Life, the, the be true to yourself above all else. Life. The world says, do you have something you want? Go get it. Go get it. After all, that's the point of life. That's the point of freedom, isn't it? It's the point of all of this. And so here you are, you're stepping out into the world, you're entering the world, and the question arises, what are you going to do with your newfound freedom? And I'm sure that, that you have had folks point this out to you over and over again, and you may be a little bit tired of hearing it, but bear with me this morning. You're faced with a freedom now that's going to force you to decide, where do I go next? What do I pursue? What do I run after? And it's a decision that all of us are faced with each and every day. And so the world is going to tell you, run hard after your cravings. Run hard after whatever you want. After all, the only freedom is to do whatever you want. But let me give you a a little bit of a warning this morning for all of us. Um, That kind of freedom, that kind of freedom is is a lie. Because this, this is what happens. Ultimately, when we pursue the freedom to follow our passions, what happens is that freedom to follow our passions just makes us a slave to them. When we follow our stomachs, our stomachs become our masters. And it's a story that we see repeated over and over again in the world. And of course, Jesus knowing all things, it's a story that we see right here in the parable of the prodigal son. And so this is what it says beginning in in the second half of verse 12. It says, so he, the father, um, distributed the assets to them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. Spent it all. And so after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country. There's no food left. Severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. And so then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. Jesus is painting for the Pharisees here a picture of rock bottom. There is nothing worse than this for a Jew. No self-respecting Jew would tend to pigs. Pigs were unclean. They were untouchable for the people of God. And so to reach the point of not only tending the pigs, but craving pig food. I mean, can you imagine, um, can you imagine being so hungry that you craved the food out of your dog's bowl? That that to you was appetizing. And you just wished that somebody would give you some dog food to keep going. Take that, multiply it. That's what's going on here. And so the younger son has this problem, right? He has followed the, uh, for lack of a better word, the modern American dream. That's what he's done. He's followed this modern American dream. Just go out and follow your passions, do what you want. And he finds himself in the worst position of his life. And so this is what happens. It's not just an isolated case Stepping out into the world, you're going to be confronted with the ability to do what you want to do. And when you want to do it, you're going to be allowed to do whatever it is that your heart desires. And the more you give in to the cravings of your stomach, the more you're going to become a slave to those cravings. Eventually, they will cost you everything. It's the picture that Jesus wants us to see here. But the story goes on, doesn't it? We know this. The prodigal does not stay there, does he? This is one of the great, one of the great truths of Scripture. He doesn't stay there. And so it says in verse 17, 
When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am, dying of hunger. I'll get up, I'll go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he gets up, he went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him. His father was looking for him and was filled with compassion. And his father ran and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, this rehearsed speech, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. Let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. He shows up. He returns to his father from that distant land and and he thinks to himself, I'll just show up. I'll kind of grovel a little bit and I will be a servant because at least his servants have food to eat. So he shows up, but before he can even arrive, the father is running after him. Son thinks that he needs to let go of his status as a son, and he's going to take on the role of a hired worker. But guess what? That was not good enough for his father. I mean, this was his son. Didn't matter. Didn't matter what he had done. This father loved his son. And, and he called him his own, and so he threw a party. And let me, let me point out something for you, um, for you to remember in the future. This party that he's throwing is the same party that the Lord throws when a prodigal college student comes home, when a, when a, when a student distracted and enslaved by the cravings of their stomachs hits rock bottom, when an adult who has lost their way and has become enslaved finds themselves in total surrender and cries out to the Lord and returns to him. This is the party that is thrown for you. And in that moment, in that moment, he surrenders before the father and the father takes him in. And so I said uh, this morning that we're going to explore three ways to live. That's the first way to live. Um, follow the cravings of your flesh into destruction. That's one temptation that life is going to throw at you. Um, But I think for most of you here, maybe you need to dial in a little bit more now because uh, there's another temptation, an opposite temptation, that I think uh, maybe for you will be more close to home. It's the temptation to follow the path of the second son. You see... um, The second son in this story is more like me. Let me just go ahead and and confess to you. It's more like me, the the law-abiding, hard-working, righteous son, right? Want to follow the rules, want to prove myself, want to get out in the world and show everyone that I am good enough. That's, That's more like me, and I think it's probably more like most of you. And so when the prodigal comes home, the response of the older son is a response of bitterness. And so let's listen to his story, beginning in verse 25. It says, now the older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he summoned one of his servants, and he questioned what these things meant. And they said, your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And so what's the response of the older son? Is it, my brother's back? No, it's not that, is it? What's our response? He becomes angry. 
He became angry, didn't want to go in, and so his father, watch what the father's doing here. His father comes out, and he pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving. You see the identity that the older son has for himself? I'm a slave. Lord, I, I have been slaving. Look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, this, this kid I can't even call my brother, when he comes back, when he came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. I mean, can you blame this guy? I mean, he spends his whole life slaving for the master. No, no, for the father. For the father. And here comes his bratty little brother, the kid who threw everything away, and it's like he gets a hero's welcome. I mean, who is this kid? Just see the wheels turning. But, but here's the real question that is being placed before us here. The question, I think, for the older brother is, who am I? Who am I? Just like the younger son is pursuing freedom, pursuing the cravings of his stomach, the older brother is running after something here too. He's pursuing something here as well. It's a little bit more subtle for us. It's a little bit more acceptable in church circumstances, but it's, it's there. Where the younger son was seeking this kind of salvation that comes from satisfying his cravings, the older brother is also seeking a kind of salvation. It's this, this kind of self-salvation from proving him self-worthy, okay? It's the, it's the perfectionistic tendency that I find in myself. It's the drive to show the world and the Father that you are one of the good ones. It's this inner craving, and it's also all that external pressure that you have to prove yourself acceptable, better than the rest, worthy of approval. And the older brother is just as much about himself as the younger brother is, just in a different way. Just in a different way. And so for you, as you step out into this world, the temptation is going to be just as strong, if not stronger, to go this route. You have been raised in good homes. You have been taught to be good people. You have been given the tools to prove yourself in this world, and that is wonderful. But if you're not careful, that's going to become the identity that you live out of. That is who I am. That's what that's going to become for you. It's going to drive you. It's going to control you. And eventually, it will make you just as bitter and just as defeated and just as joyless as the older brother. And it looks different for different people. However you define success, however you define the good people, the right crowd, however you define it, that definition will come to master you, and it will become your core identity. And so when, when you stumble, it's not just going to set you back. It will crush you because you will have lost who you are. And when you succeed, when you succeed at being one of the good people, you'll become self-righteous. You'll become a Pharisee looking down your noses at those other people, those other folks, seeing the world as this tool to compare yourself against and make yourself look good, me against them, me above them, me better than them. However it goes, it's not pretty. It's not pretty if this is the path you take. And it results, results in this bitterness that the older brother is feeling. This bitterness um, that has the older brother thinking that he deserves something so much so that he can't celebrate the return of his brother from the dead. It's the kind of attitude that splits families. It's the kind of attitude that destroys friendships. It's the kind of attitude that, that um, crushes churches from the inside out. 
But showing yourself worthy is not the message of the gospel. It's not what following Christ is all about. Living up to the standard, proving yourself is not what God wants from you. It's not what he's asking of you. Okay, I want you to hear me say that this morning. He doesn't desire your attempts at self-salvation. He doesn't want you to become a slave of the standard. He doesn't want you spending your life attempting to live up to whatever it is that you think is right and good. What he wants is your heart. And so the older brother says, I'm not going to celebrate. But the father comes out to fetch him, comes out to get him. And he responds, he says in verse 31, he says, son, he said to him. Now, do you hear, I, I hear affection in the father's voice there. I hear love in the father's voice here. Son, that is who you are. You're not some hired servant. You're not the slave that you think you are. You're not some worker that has to prove his worth. You are a son who already has the father's love, not because of his work, but because of his relationship. And so he says, son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Don't you see that? You are my son. You have access to everything. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so Jesus tells this parable and he tells it to the Pharisees and he ends it there and he just lets the Pharisees hopefully respond in some way. He's painted a picture for them. You see, both of these sons have the same problem. Both of them have the same problem. Both of them are seeking to live life on their own, to make their own way. One's trying to do it through freedom, pursuing all those cravings and desires. One's trying to do it by being righteous and good and being one of those good people. And the world tells us that those are the two paths. That those are the only two real options in the world. These seem to be the two ways to live. Either follow the law or follow your heart. Okay? Either prove yourself to the world or do what you want. Right? Those are the options that the world sets before us. Call it what you will. I mean, there are so many names for it. It's like you've got religion and irreligion. You've got liberalism and conservatism. You've got moralism and freedom. And these are the, these are, this is the dichotomy, the one against the other that the world sets in front of us. Whatever you label them, there, there appear to be only two ways to live. But there is a, a third way. It's the way, of, it's the way of sonship. It's the way of being a son, a daughter of the king. It's not the way of pursuit, of running after, but of being pursued. Do you notice that the God, the, the Father in this parable, pursues both of them? You have been pursued. You have been pursued in the person of Jesus Christ who stepped down out of heaven to run after you. He's come for you. And so this is the identity that God wants us to have, wants us to own. This is the life that he wants us to live, a life in relationship with him, a life where our hearts belong to him, a life where we see the Father running after us, calling us a son, a daughter, inviting us into the family, belonging to him. If you follow 
the way of the prodigal, it will crush you. If you follow the way of the older brother, it will make you bitter and joyless. But if we'll set aside that pursuit of freedom that only leads to slavery of our stomachs, and if we set aside that pursuit of perfection that leads only to bitterness and brokenness, we're going to find that we have been pursued and that all of our efforts mean nothing next to the efforts of the Father to call us back into relationship with himself. It's there. It's there that we really find freedom. You want freedom? That's where you find it. And it's there that, that bitterness gives way to joy. So the question this morning is, which, which way are we going to live? Which identity is ours? Have we seen the Father running toward us? Have we seen the Father coming to us? Have we heard him call us sons and daughters? Are we his? I'm going to pray. Um, and if you need to respond, you come. Let's pray. And so, Lord, we, we are astounded that in spite of all that we have tried to do on our own, all the ways that we have rejected you and turned from you, that you, Lord, have pursued us. And so help us to respond to you. Help us, Lord, to, to, to know that our identity is as your children. And that that would be um, the way that we live. That would be the life that we live. Not constantly running after all of these other things, but Lord, responding to you, surrendering to you, and living in your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided